Hello and welcome to DevFest 2020. I'm Jason Titus, VP of Engineering at Google, joining you from my home in California. Each year, we at Google truly feel the anticipation for DevFest. It's a one-of-a-kind series of developer conferences, and we're glad you can join us and the local developers within your community. Your local DevFest event this weekend is one of hundreds taking place all around the world right at this moment. And what makes DevFest truly unique is that it's run by volunteer community organizers on a mission to help other local developers grow and share a passion for Google technologies. Now, 2020 has been a year of radical change for people across the globe. But when difficult times came about, developers within this community came together online to plan a virtual DevFest where each local chapter could participate, helping each other teach and learn when we need to connect the most. And these connections can be so important. I can remember the first developer conferences I went to, where I met people who were already doing the kinds of things I dreamed of doing. They had started companies, built products, and I got to hear the stories of what had worked and what had gone wrong. And we hope that all of you will get to have similar experiences at DevFest this year. At Google, we've always believed that we are only successful when all of our users are successful. While Google and its products may plant a seed, it's developers like yourself who make the seeds grow and thrive. This community of developers has shown us firsthand how you're using technology to help each other during times of need. Let me introduce you to my teammate, David, to share with you some great examples. Welcome, David. Hi, Jason. Thank you. And welcome, everybody, to this year's DevFest season. I'm David McLaughlin, Director of Developer Ecosystems at Google. So I've been with DevFest since the very first year in 2010, when I was able to join a, a large percentage of them. Back then, they were a series of targeted events in just a handful of countries. In the years since then, we've had massive growth to countries all over the world. While I really do miss being able to join many of you in person this year, I'm happy to be able to continue the celebration of developers and tech in a new virtual format and bring people together to learn and to share what we're all building. Over the years, it's been great to see the apps and the solutions the broader community has built with the support of their local GDG chapters. We now have thousands and thousands of developers who are working to address real world problems in their local communities. Particularly during the challenging times of COVID, I'm impressed by how much your work has made people's lives better. There's a few recent examples that truly stand out to me. Community developers from GDG West Sweden recently worked with the Swedish government to create Hack the Crisis, an event focused on designing, testing, and executing ideas in response to recent challenges. One of the finalists, named Remote and Gigs, helped modernize the Swedish government's employment website to match job seekers with remote work. Nearby in Romania, GDG groups organized a hackathon gathering 270 different mentors and students from across eight different countries. The hackathon brought together developers to save lives, to save communities, and to save businesses. Some of the winners included an online platform that connected volunteers with nonprofits across the region, a system to help doctors work with each other and to ease online consultations, and a personal assistant for health and nutrition tracking. Another cool app that they developed was Risk Alert, an app that alerts emergency rooms that a patient with a very rare disease is about to arrive so that the hospital can prepare for any special needs. In Asia, GDG Tainan initiated the mask inventory map at the start of COVID-19, which crowdsources mask inventory from local store data, combining it with the Google Maps API. The project was so popular that it caught the attention of Taiwan's government inspiring them to publish public data APIs on mask inventory managed by the government. Taiwan's digital minister has since encouraged the GDG Tainan chapter to create more than 100 different apps to help the local community. In India, GDG Cloud Pune used machine learning with TensorFlow and GCP to help their community with an app that remotely analyzes dental health and helps patients book at-home dental services. They've had over 300 trained images so far, and the developer community is working with local universities to gather more than 50,000 dental images to improve the application. In the Middle East, 
The region's largest International Women's Day event was held in April in Turkey by multiple GDG groups working together. They had over 2,500 attendees to the event, which included a raffle for online courses and talks in artificial intelligence and data mining. The event helped women across the community and across the region learn and apply their skills. And of course, here in the United States, the GDG Memphis chapter has joined GiveCamp, where software developers in the area donate their skills for nonprofits, as well as helping kids learn to code on the weekends. These are just a small sample of the ways that Google Developer Group chapters and communities like yours all over the world are learning together and giving back what they've learned to really help people's lives everywhere be better. I encourage all of you to continue, be in community with your fellow developers. Think about how can you use the skills and the tech that you're learning this weekend at DevFest, as well as the networks and the communities that you form, the new friends that you make. How do you combine all of these to make a difference in your own area? Now let's take a look at a really inspiring story from Uganda. It shows how a community member started learning about machine learning and ended up building a really nifty app using TensorFlow that detects diseases in plants and helps farmers reduce crop devastation. Take a look. Growing up in the city, I never expected to work in agriculture. But when fall armyworm attacked, it affected us all. Since its arrival in 2016, this crop pest has caused massive devastation. I've met farmers who have lost everything. So I wanted to use my skills as a software developer to help. At a Google Study Jam, we taught ourselves TensorFlow. We started by building an Android app on top of an open source API. The app allows farmers to spot infestations early, far beyond the capability of human eyes, and suggest an effective treatment. When I was younger, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but then I discovered app development, and I was excited to show people something they never thought possible. Machine learning gives us the advantage against fall armyworm ultimately saving harvests and reducing pesticides. We're just getting started and there are so many other sectors like health and education that machine learning could really improve. Farming is a crucial aspect of life in Uganda, and I feel proud. I'm part of a team driving to ensure our culture can continue. Earlier, you saw a beautiful inspirational video about how machine learning and Android were used to create an app to detect crop diseases. So for DevFest, I wanted to get together a few of my friends from Google and beyond to show you how you could get started in building something just like that from scratch in a few minutes. We'll build an Android app and a web app. So to get started with Android, let's see what Chet can teach us. I want to create an app that's able to recognize information about plants. It's going to need camera functionality as well as machine learning inference. Let's see what that looks like in code. The app is written in Kotlin and uses CameraX to take the pictures, an ML kit for on-device machine learning analysis. The core functionality is in Take Photo, where we take a picture, analyze it, and display the results. First, we call Take Picture on a Camera X image capture object that was created earlier. One of the parameters is a callback object, which has this on capture success function. We get the received image into the format we need for MLKit, then we create an image labeler object and process the image. When this succeeds, we receive a collection of image labels, which we turn into text strings and display a toast with the results. Let's see what the demo looks like. So we'll take a picture and it says, I see an insect and a plant. So that was pretty easy, rigging up CameraX and ML Kit to detect arbitrary objects in the camera view. But the results were 
pretty generic because the data set didn't have enough information about our domain. So let's dig a little deeper. Okay, let's go deeper. Now we need a model for something very specific, detecting diseases in bean plants instead of cassava. Let's explore how to build it. On this guide, we will use some of the great TensorFlow tooling available. Let's start with Colab. You can understand Colab as a cloud-hosted development tool. We will do all our coding on it, and you will not need to install anything on your machine. Let's start with a new notebook. Let's just turn the Python to beans. We will need to install some packages that we are going to use later. These packages are not installed on your machine. They are on a cloud machine that was created for your collab. Nice, it finished installing the packages. Let's download the data and do some visualization to understand how our data is separated. Perfect. We download the data. Let's take a look on some of the images so we can have a better understanding of what we are doing here. Here they are. These are some of the images that will be used for training our model later. Now we have the data. We need to create a model. We are not going to create one from scratch. We are going to use a technique called transfer learning. TensorFlow Hub is a repository for TensorFlow models. You can find all kinds of models here. Let's start with this one. Let's go back to our collab. Let's define a model handle. Nice. Now we have the data and the base model. How can we do transfer learning? To do that, we are going to use one of the tooling that I mentioned before called Model Maker. Model Maker make your life way easier when you need to do transfer learning. Let's create the spec for our base model. Let's create our train variables here using the data set beans that we've just seen. And now we are going to put everything together with Model Maker by defining a model with the training data and the spec that we got from TensorFlow Hub. This will take a couple of minutes. It finished training. And as you can see here, our accuracy is at 87%. Of course, let's evaluate the model with some data it didn't see yet and see how good it is. Nice, 95%. The TensorFlow Lite model Gus just created contains all the metadata Android Studio needs to recognize it and automatically build classes for it. To get started, you can update your build.gradle file to include the following TensorFlow Lite dependencies. Then, you'll want to import your generated TF Lite file into the ML folder of your project. Let's check out the details of our imported model. From here, we can see an example of how to use the model in our app. Let's move over to the main activity class to take advantage of it. Inside of our image capture callback here on line number 78, we create an instance of our model. Next, we use it to process the captured image here on line number 84. And finally, here on lines 92 through 98, we display the results of consuming the output inside of a toast message. Let's run our app. Now, instead of telling us it's looking at a leaf or a plant, it can actually tell us if it's looking at a bean leaf and give a diagnosis. Sweet. So this concept works, but it's very much a raw demo. What if we want to make this a more successful app? Well, we'd probably need to add services like authentication so our users can sign in analytics and A-B testing so we can find out how our users are really interacting with our app, some crash reporting or performance monitoring, and an easy way to save our users' data to the cloud. Luckily, that's where Firebase comes in. Now, the new and improved Firebase plugin in Android Studio makes this simple. I'll start by adding some analytics so I can find out exactly how our users are interacting with our app. And the plugin does most of the work to get the library integrated into my project. Now that I've done that, well, we can uh, get an instance of the library up here, and then we can log what kind of results we're getting from MLKit. And then once we've done that, there's a lot of ways to get at this data. It'll start showing up here in the Firebase dashboard, but I find one really fun way of viewing this data is to use StreamView, which kind of gives you a real timey sample of what kinds of analytics results we're seeing. Looks like I've already recorded several of these select content events, and I can dig into these event properties and see what kinds of results our users are getting. And I could start using that information to maybe refine my MLKit model or A-B test different alternatives. 
Firebase helps you build better apps, and analytics is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Maybe we could let our users upload their own pictures and store them in the cloud using cloud storage for Firebase. There's so many possibilities. This is a sample app, but if we were to productize this, it's important to keep in mind how our AI design decisions impact our users. For instance, we need to consider if and or how it makes sense to display confidence intervals to help your users interpret the ML model output. Or say, how you design the onboarding experience sets user expectations for the capabilities and limitations of your ML-based app, which is vital to app adoption and engagement. For more guidance on AI design decisions, check out the People Plus AI Guidebook at pair.withgoogle.com slash guidebook. This use case focuses on plant diseases, but for other use cases where our ML-based predictions intersect with people or communities, we absolutely need to think about responsible AI themes like privacy and fairness, which you can learn more about at tensorflow.org slash resources slash responsible dash AI. And don't forget about the web. I built a PWA that can be installed across all your users' platforms. It combines the web camera with TensorFlow.js, and by integrating machine learning, we can make an amazing experience that runs across all browsers. Now let's take a look. We have our standard project layout with a HTML file, a manifest, and a service worker to make it a PWA. We have some styles to make it look good, and our data folder that contains our TensorFlow configuration and trained model that we're going to use in the app. Now to the heart of the project. Let's go back to the HTML file and see what's happening. We're also loading the webcam object. This is just a class that wraps some boilerplate logic to make it easier to pass camera data from get user media to TensorFlow. And now let's dive into our app logic in index.js. So I'm just going to use Chrome and the debugger here. And this is only so you can kind of see how easy it is to integrate machine learning into your application. So let's get started by clicking the classify button, get the machine learning gears into action. And immediately, we break into the TensorFlow tidy function. This is just there to help you kind of clean up any of the memory that TensorFlow uses whilst it makes a prediction. We get our image from the web camera, and then we pass our image back into the, uh, into the machine learning algorithm to make it a prediction. And once we've got a prediction, we access the data, and then we can use that data to update the user interface kind of based on any application logic that we want. And that's pretty much it. Great, so now you have the platform for building a real app with the tooling from Android Studio, the APIs from CameraX, Jetpack, MLKit, Colab, TensorFlow, Firebase, Chrome, and Google Cloud, you have a lot of things that just work better together. This isn't a finished project by any means, just a proof of concept for how a minimum viable product with a roadmap to completion can be put together using Google's developer tools and APIs. You might also wanna open source this project too. So developers can suggest improvements, optimizations, or, and even additional features by filing an issue or sending a pull request. It's a great way to get your hard work in front of even more people. We'd love to help you with this, and you can learn more about the process at opensource.guide slash starting a project. Indeed, we've already open sourced the bean disease sample we discussed in this video, so you can have a great place to start. Thanks, Pooja. And as you mentioned, open sourcing a project is a great way to make it grow and inspire people to adopt and extend it. If you want to learn more about what you've seen in this video, please visit us at developers.google.com. Hi, developers. My name is Annie Jean-Baptiste, and I'm the head of product inclusion at Google. The demo you just saw shows how Google's products can come together to create an amazing app. But what about product inclusion? You may be wondering, well, what is product inclusion and why is it important? At Google, we believe that giving power to new voices is the core of innovation. When we bring an inclusive lens to the product design process, we amplify underrepresented voices and allow all users to feel seen and validated in the moments that matter for them. We look beyond ourselves and seek out diverse voices to shape the products that we build. We also believe that we have a responsibility not to disappoint our users, no matter who they are, what they look like, how much money they make, who they love, how old they are, or anything that makes them them. And when we make difference the new normal, we will usher in new opportunities to grow our business by earning the love of all of our users. So whether you're one or 105 years old, live in a city or a remote village, on Wi-Fi or cellular service, Google is there for you to make sure you have the answers you need when you need them. Product inclusion is exactly what it sounds like. 
bringing an inclusive lens throughout the entire product design process to create more inclusive products for our users. And so when you're developing your own apps, I challenge you to incorporate the principles of product inclusion into the design process. Because we believe that you can do well and do good by being intentional about including underrepresented voices at key points in the product design process. Remember, those closest to the problem are also closest to the solution. You can learn more about product inclusion at Google by visiting accelerate.withgoogle.com. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Jen Cole, and I'm the Global Developer Communities Program Manager at Google. Now it's time to meet and hear from your local developers. So what can you expect next from your local DevFest? We'll have technical talks, breakout sessions, networking opportunities, and more. These sessions will cover a variety of technologies, such as Android, Google Cloud Platform, machine learning with TensorFlow, Web, Firebase, Google Assistant, and Flutter, with speakers from Google, women tech makers, Google developer experts, and your local community. Be sure to claim your badge for participating in DevFest 2020 by going to google.dev slash DevFest 2020. You can earn even more badges by mastering different Google technologies available on developers.google.com learn. As a reminder, one of the most important parts of DevFest is providing an inclusive and harassment-free experience for everyone. As an active participant of DevFest today, we can all agree to treat everyone with respect and to speak up if we see or experience harassment of any kind. Together, we can create an environment that is welcoming and inclusive to everyone with us here today. Follow at GDG on Twitter for highlights from DevFest around the world and try out the DevFest AR filter and avatar. Share what you're learning or your favorite part about the event on social media with hashtag DevFest. And lastly, don't forget community is all about getting to know one another. Use the virtual breakout rooms and chat feature to connect with other developers near you with shared interests. We hope you enjoyed DevFest 2020. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to one more GDG Tech Sessions event. As you may notice, this is a different visual aspect that we have on, on the stream today. This is a special edition because besides counting with two uh, great speakers, we also have this um, has a special event about the death fest of all GDGs um, in the country, in the country, in the world also. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know what is the GDG Tech Sessions, I'm going to briefly explain you and to not to put AD waiting for me. So I will just briefly explain you what is the GDG Tech Sessions. So uh, as you know, at the, at the beginning of this year, coronavirus hit us very, very hard and we have to change our lives and put all the things that we do in person to and like an online, um, event on, a, on an online way. So our team noticed that, and noticed also that some communities have, communities have problems on doing uh, online events. So we joined forces and we created uh, a framework which we call by Google GDG Tech Sessions, which enable, as I told you, any community uh, to share uh, tech contents about uh, a topic that they may like. Uh, since the beginning of the DDG Tech Sessions, we have more than a handful of um, events. We count with the participation of various um, speakers from different areas of uh, Europe, and also we count with the participation of viewers from different parts of the world, of course. So at the same time, we are creating like an online repository of tech sessions, which you can now um view it and in order to improve your uh, skills so by now you already know what you have to do you have to subscribe our channel and hit that uh, subscribe bell so you will get notified when we upload a new video or when we go um live so without any further ado let me introduce you the great eddie uh, eddie thank you very much for for being here 
So Heidi is a voice UX expert. So we are, before starting the, the stream, we are talking about how you find time for doing all these things. Because for those of you who don't know, Heidi is a mother of four children. He is like an international um, speaker. Uh, she conducts um, online workshops and courses, and she's part of the program Invisible Innovation. So just this is just was not enough for 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 him for he for she sorry. Uh, so then she wrote a book. So you see yeah. we are here. Yeah. At, <laughs> we are here at very good hands. So the talk today is about voice emotional design. So Heavy will explain is how we can create great voice applications that will engage our users in our company in our product. And Eddie will also, will also um, share um, her experience about, you know, uh, designing a voice, which is a topic that I find interesting because I thought that, okay, design was just for image or, or video. No, you can also today design uh, your voice or your personal assistant, which is very, very, very interesting. So, Eddie, we are very grateful to you uh, to have accepted this uh, invitation. And on behalf of the Tech Sessions, we would like to thank you very, very much for being here today. So, now we don't have a, a physical stage, so the virtual stage is yet. Thank you very much, Eddie. Yeah. Hello, hi everyone. I'm so happy to be with you. I, would, I wish I would have been really with you. And, and today uh, we're going to have a talk about voice design, emotional design. And, and I want to, to ask you all just to sit and relax and enjoy the session. I can just imagine what it'd be if I would have been in your place in this very beautiful island and next to the sea, everything around you is blue. So let's just imagine that this, this is what we have now. Okay, so through, the, through this session, I'm gonna to talk to you about what I know about myself, about how I see my profession and about voice design, and I hope you'll enjoy it. So let's start. So just imagine your first talk with, from the kindergarten maybe, or first grade, with your first love, and, and the way you met, and who she or he was, and, and just imagine the, this meeting and what was it that you talked about. And then you can imagine your favorite teacher at school and maybe imagine the, the lesson that you learned together. And, and then you can imagine if you have kids, maybe could you imagine their first words? So all these experiences are connected to words. So language is really what makes us human. This is how we convey ideas. This is how we convey our feelings. This is how we convey what we're doing together, communicating as human beings. And especially now, because everybody is separated, we know the importance of the human connection. But in all these experiences that you talked about right now and you imagined yourself in, you don't really remember the exact words you told your first love, I guess, and you don't really, really remember what are the exact phrases that you were taught. And that's because the words are vehicles for our emotion. And what we remember is that we loved this uh, person that in, in, we talked to. And the feeling is more important, it's, it's created within our mind, and we're wired to feel and to remember emotion. And emotions is what we are built for, actually. And words are just a mean to an end for us to connect. So when two people speak, in many cases, what the content is, is not that important as the fact that they communicate and talk to each other. And that's why when we talk about the voice experiences, and I guess that many, many of you use voice assistants, maybe to ask for direction or to ask for translation or for a small uh, trivia question or whatever. Many people use these devices either on mobile or in smart speakers. And the experience to talk with them seems really 
obvious, but it's much more than conveying information. So our relationship with machine started very, very in, in, in our past, and we know it from a culture and from the movies and, and from books we read, and we always imagined us talking to these entities, to the machines, to robots, to some kind of intelligence which is not human. And we always wanted a relationship with these machines. And only in the last few years, you could say, this dream became a reality. We can talk naturally and, and without even thinking to a device, and it will answer us as a human being. It even understand us as a human being. So this, is, uh, this experience is so, so new for us. And, and because it's new, we have so much to learn and to enjoy from. So hi, I'm Adima Zocario. I'm an innovation and a voice uh, design expert. And I want to tell you my story because you don't see me like a whole person and I cannot like tell you, uh, I cannot see you and you cannot really see me as a full person. I would like to tell you who I am and how I came to do what I do. So my story began um, when I was pregnant with the second child, I was doing my master's degree in, in cognitive science and I was a product designer in a cybersecurity company. And I really wanted to, to be the best designer ever and change the world, at least as Steve Jobs. And I wanted to create successful products that people love and buy. And actually, I, I, I worked with a company that earned lots, lots of money compared to a small company. And, and they didn't really want to innovate and change all the time. And I felt a bit like a failure because I was not doing the best I can. It was not that interesting for me. And, and I was a bit disappointed. And, I'm, and I felt I, I, I'm not enough because some of the people who learned with the first degree, I, I learned design. And some of them worked with very large corporate uh, companies. And some of them started a startup. And I felt it's not as I wanted. And then... An unexpected change happened. And after I gave birth, I was in maternity leave with my child. And I got a call from my office. And they told me to come to meet my manager, my CEO. And I took my baby and placed it within my baby carrier. And I took him to the office. And, and I opened the door and, uh, to, to the CEO office. And I, I don't really remember much from this talk. I just remember that my heart pounded really, really fast when he fired me. And because it pounded so powerfully, the baby started to talk, it started, started to cry when the CEO talked and said that, that I'm fired. So he started to cry because my heart banged against his small chest. And this is the only thing I remembered from being there. And I was totally in shock. And I came back, this is my small child and, and my first one. And I looked at them and I, I, I said, how will I pay my rent? How will I finish my second degree studies? I will like find a work that is suitable for small kids. And, and I was very, very um, terrified, I would say. And it was a very low point in my life. And then something really uh, powerful happened. A friend of mine called me and he said, okay, I'm gonna, uh, send a client over to you and it was a very successful startup it still exists today uh, like uh, 15 or 20 years ago when I started and and it means that it's a very successful startup if it's still there it was called, called Clarizen and then in this first time that I was a, as a freelancer something really amazing happened because the product manager called me to, to his office and he showed me all the matrices, all the graphs of matrices that they collected. And at that, at that time, collecting data was not that common and most startups did not really do all these things. And it was shocking for me because it was the first one, time I understood the impact of what I'm doing because the matrices were really, really low. So less people coming into the site, less people staying in the site, more retention and so forth. And it was the first time I really understood the impact of innovation powered by design. So it was the first time I really understood how powerful design and how important my work is. 
and I decided to work as, 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 as many products on many as many projects as many products as possible and create real value for the, my clients uh, and for their clients and for the success. But not all went well. So you see, I, this is only a very, very small percentage of work that, that I took part in. And, and at that time, it was very hard for startups and they were struggling and companies were struggling to create a good experience and good products. And many of them failed and most of them are not existent today. And that's because they didn't have any clear methods for uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, how to create a product, how to really go and, and create a better and better experience and to grow a company actually, and to get to this product market fit. And it was a very hard way and, and startups need to learn the hard way. How can they uh, innovate and create successful uh, products? And then I decided, okay, so now I'm going to do it as best as I can. And I worked like from there, like 15 years since then, 20 in, in a total. And I worked with the most successful entrepreneurs in Israel and all over the world. And I, I met so many interesting people, so many interesting products and projects that I've done all over the world. You see, I, I, I went and visited you too in one of these uh, uh, workshops that I gave and, and at one point about seven years ago Google approached me and, and asked me to join their accelerator afterwards I joined the GDE and then I jo joined some of the other uh, uh, Google uh, rela uh, developer relations initiatives and I went all over the world speaking and, and doing uh, workshops and and as you can see it was a very fruitful and interesting time just to learn from so many um, and people and so many opportunities and, and most importantly learning from doing, from executing, from working with so many companies and, and just trying things out and seeing how it works and failing and learning, which is the only way to really learn. So since then I worked with so many clients that are here, some of them, and during these like 20 years, I established my own invincible innovation methods that I teach in workshop and I help companies really design better products. And one of the things that I'm doing in Google is um, I'm, I'm a, a GDE for the assistant. So I've been talking in the assistant on air in their uh, series and I uh, created the voice strategy and design course on Udemy. And I've, I've been doing lots of uh, design sprints for voice all over the world. So today we're going to focus on that part of what I'm doing. So now that you know me more, we can talk about what is the subject of our discussion. And I hope that you feel more connected to me and not only just this talking head here. So in the next about 40 minutes, we're going to talk about four things. First, the connection with the assistant, and I call it I love Alexa. And then we're going to talk about the power of emotions in design in general. Then we're going to talk about designing this connection in voice. So why, why is voice more uh, related to emotion than a uh, regular design of screens and visuals? And then we're going to talk about the future, what could be the future of voice assistants. So let's start with the, the fact that most people really connect to their assistants. And we know that the adoption rate of uh, these smart speakers, which is the first graph, was much steeper and faster than any other technology. So you can see that, uh, for example, if you're taking the, um, the first uh, line, which is uh, TV, it took much, much more than uh, uh, the, the mobile. You know that the mobile revolution was for us really fast and it took about six and a half, seven years to get to 50% of the households in the, in, the, in the US. So this is the blue line. And when we see that in, in, in comparison to, to, to the voice uh, smart speakers, it took only three and a half years for the smart speakers to get to 50% of the households in the US which is the fastest growing technology ever. So I don't know how much is it like in your region because it depends on the language that you're using. So first, English is, is was the first one because it's in the US and UK and so many speak, people speak uh, it. But in general, it went very fast and viral to so many households uh, and it's very, very popular. And 
um, the manager from Adobe said that this is the most important tech boom designers are ignoring. Because currently when we think about um, assistants, we have only a few of them. We have uh, um, Siri, we have uh, Google, uh, Google Home, we have um, uh, Alexa and Cortana. More or less, there are some of them, there are some more of them, but these are the main ones. But we know there are going to be more and more of them as we uh, continue, and we know that it's growing. And, and when people are thinking about voice, they are uh, automatically built to talk to people. We are not connected to any other human beings as we are connected to, to people, and our brain is wired to talk to human beings. So when we hear a human voice, we automatically connect the personality to it, and we can know a lot about this voice just for, by hearing it. We know the age, and we know, of course, the gender, and we know um, their, um, their size, uh, how big they are, how tall they are, because the size of, of their chest is connected to, the, to the, um, how strong the voice is. We know their uh, mental state, because when somebody is angry, you know they will talk angry, and we know when they are calm, the, the voice is calmer. And we can recognize people from the, what the region that they come from, from the voice. So we, we assign a personality just by hearing that. And for us, when we hear a human voice, it really makes sense that to be connected to it. And, and I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine. He has, like, I think a, a girl called, I think she's four or five years old. And uh, they had Alexa, he's really crazy about all the uh, digital things and, and uh, you know, like, He's trying everything, so he took Alexa and connected everything in the house to Alexa. And, and every time they come to their home, they just ask her to open the light, open the, the air condition, everything is connected to Alexa. And, and his kid is, is so used to having Alexa next to her in her bedroom. And then they decided to move in the house. And she asked him, and will, will Alexa come with us? And for her, it's, it's just another person living with them, it's a family. And then he, she told him, uh, I love Alexa, I want her to come. And, and when you imagine a kid be, being connected to someone, this is what happens when they talk to these devices and they don't, don't see any like, difference than, than talking to usual uh, human being. And we know that when the people were asked to, to name a woman, which is a tech leader, it was very hard for them, unfortunately. And some of them said uh, Alexa and Siri. And, and it's not only kids, it seems, that relate to these devices as human beings. And I want to tell you a story um, about a research from three years ago, only when it started uh, the voice assistant, or nothing, maybe it didn't start, but it was in the beginning. And they wanted to see how will the, these devices, Siri and Alexa, will answer if they were harassed sexually. So they will curse them and see what would be the response. So one of the response, I'll give you only one of them, is when, when they, they said, you're a bitch, Siri said, I'd blush if I could. So that was the response. And it's not by mistake, this is by design. She didn't, she didn't answer, I don't understand, or say it again. She said in a designed answer that some people from, from the Siri design uh, uh, teams thought it would be a good answer. And this is why, because this is because they wanted to make Siri more sassy and, and fun to be with. And this is how she answered. And, and when the research and the post went out, everybody talked about it and then they changed it. It's not that she's um, very um, like strict in her answer, but she's not answering this anymore. You could, you could try it. But the question is, what would be the influence if we get used to talk to these devices? What the influence will be on our communication with human beings, which is not Siri or Alexa. And we know how to communicate and to understand voice and emotion. As I said, we know what is the energy in the voice. We know that the way we breathe, when we are very angry, we don't breathe that much. When we are calm, we have deeper breathe. And we know the muscle tension. And this tells us so much about 
uh, the person and the, and, and the state, the mental state he is in, the, the emotional state that he is in. And the same could be with these devices. So currently, they do understand what, what our state is. So they can read our emotions, and they are not that good as expressing any kind of layer other than the content. But when they grow and learn more, they could imitate a human being in a better way. And they can really integrate their way of communicating to the way that we are used to talk. So if we're calm, they will be calm too. And maybe they will be relating to us in the way that will calm us even. So they really can really go into our mind, understand us more than, they, than we think. It's not only that they understand what we're saying, and it's really an, uh, important to understand their capabilities. So people get knowledge and the emotional connection when they're using voice as if when they're talking to humans. And how do we know that? First, like I think that four years ago that we knew from an ad that uh, Apple uh, had uh, wanted to find an engineer that understands psychology. And, you know, Apple is not really conveying any information and not too much uh, to the open public. But we know that they said that the people are talking to Siri as a therapist. So they wanted someone to really understand not only what they, they wanted to talk, they wanted to understand their mental state and what is right to tell them once they are talking to Siri as a therapist, as a psychologist. And we know that because this is the data that they currently have and i'm sure it's growing so as long as we're getting more and more used to these devices we know the emotional connection is getting bigger the trust is getting bigger and we we as we trust people more we tell them more and we're connected to them more so after a few years we know that it might be bigger another way we can test it is with uh, research so uh, they try to See, we know that we meet new people, we are getting more excited, and then our hands are more sweaty. And when the hands are more sweaty, they, we can measure uh, the, the tension in the hands, so the, 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 um, how the GSR level is in our hands. So they tested the same arousal, emotional arousal state, when interacting with the virtual assistant. So, a, a, a person talked to Alexa for the first time, and the reaction was when Alexa answered the same as to a new person that you meet, especially if Alexa told a small story or a joke, it was even higher. So we know that this connection is not different because we're talking to a technology. It's the same as talking to a new person that we meet, and the connection is very, very the same in our mind. And, and these virtual assistants really can detect everything in our voice. They can detect if we are in a bad mood, and it, it can detect uh, what we're going to do from this bad mood, for example. And this is a, a bit related to uh, like what, how can we see this technology going further? But we know that they have more human uh, qualities and, and the connection with them is much more human than typing or seeing the screen because we're using something which is so natural for us as voice. And we know that it could improve customer experience. Let's say if you're going to a store, it could talk to you. If you're shopping online, it could talk to you. If, you're, uh, if you want something which is like a service or support, it could be much, much more easier than typing or doing a chat. So it's really going to that direction. And uh, when you imagine this thing that you talk to all the time, you could talk to him when you're at home, when you're going to your bedroom, to your living room, then you take it with you in your mobile and then to your car. And if you're in, the, in the high tension, he knows, she knows that you're in a different state. And therefore, if you're very in a bad mood and maybe you're angry and you're driving, it could help you calm when you die, maybe, and it could prevent reckless driving because she, she knows that you're very, very tense and very angry, and maybe you had a fight with, with your spouse before you went to, to the car, or 
whatever, but she could recognize how you are right now compared to your regular state. And, and it could even uh, monitor your health. When we're thinking about uh, currently the, the coronavirus is hurting our lungs and the way we breathe, it could really understand what is the pattern of our breathing because we talk to it so much. And once it's deteriorating or changing a bit or our breathing is changing, because currently we need to have like seven or eight, 10 words, depends on the, on the size of the words and the person, until we take a breath. So machines uh, theoretically could talk endlessly without taking these stops, but us as human beings, we need to really breathe all the time, apparently. So they could measure how well we breathe and if it's different, and maybe our breathing is more shallow, and then really understand our, our uh, health uh, state. Could you imagine that in the middle of a quarrel with your spouse, you're fighting, you're, you're shouting, you're cursing, and then you're in the living room of your own apartment, and then somebody comes there, listens to you, and gives you an advice. Could you just imagine the situation of a very intimate situation with your partner that usually nobody's there when you're fighting, and then somebody comes there. So actually, if this someone is already uh, available. So these uh, uh, Alexa and Google Home could really have, they have the capacity to really understand couples because they know the patterns of communication between couples and even maybe coach them and help them have a better communication because they know when the tension is going up, they know when the pattern is going faster and louder and more angry and when the sentences are getting more shorter and in higher pitch and bots. So they know when couples are going to fight. And I can tell you one story that in the past, I think like six years ago already, uh, there was a fight in, in, of, of a, a, a person with his wife. He, he fighted with her and then she called 911 in the US and, and she asked Alexa to call 911. And then when you ask Alexa to open the mic and to talk to her, she records everything. And it was a domestic violent case until the, until the point that he murdered her. And then everybody asked uh, Amazon to give the recording. And it was a trial until they really agreed to give the, the, the recording for that, from that day. Uh, and he was uh, convicted. With, with murder. So, so they're there and they're listening and, and it, it's a very uh, interesting thing to know what they know and, and what they can record. So because of that, there, somebody thought about the opportunity to take the layer of emotional information out of the equation. So there are some kind of software that would like to, that you could talk to and, and then it only conveys the information from the content and not from the emotional level. And, and this is because uh, we don't know who is using the information about us, who could hack our brain and really use it. And maybe they see that we are more moving less, we are more down. Maybe then this is the best time to just uh, send us an ad for Ben and Jerry's ice cream just to calm us down. So somebody could could use this information if, if they want. So now I want to talk about using the power of uh, emotions. But uh, before I do that, I want to have like a small session of uh, questions because I don't want to talk to you that much. So I will ask uh, Diog if he has any questions for me. Well, yes, I do have some questions. So you started your presentation saying that, okay, language makes us humans, okay? And now we are trying to put those kinds of intelligence things on a personal assistance. So, which I find it very interesting and very useful having, I, I'm not saying the word because he, he, she will wake up and start to hear me. Um, but uh, can this cause some harm in our social life? For example, in the way I interact with my friends or even uh, with other colleagues or other peers, uh, what is this effect of social networks? 
I think we cannot really dissociate this effect on technology as a whole in our life. So you could see that we're getting more and more attached to the digital world and less attached to the real world there outside, especially right now when we're doing this, everything is digital and it's it just went there and now it's just speaking. So it's it's where this is the trend, this is the direction. I could say that the layer of emotional connection, which is the highest connection you can have with something. When you're relating to someone, you could just see him, you could just talk to him, and then we get connected emotionally. This is the highest connection that you could have. So this could be a, a way of getting more and more into the digital world. And it could be good because sometimes people are really lonely. And, you know, many people, it doesn't matter what age, they are lonely in the, in the Western world. And, and maybe it could make her, their life easier. Maybe older people especially now close at home, but not only that they are lonely. On the other side, the fact that people are not connected to the outside world and to real friends, not these ones with the likes on, on, on Facebook, I think that we need human connection and it can never be the same. Even if, if Google really wants to take all, all, all the developers and Amazon wants to take all the developers in the world, it will not be exactly as we are in the human being. Yeah, and actually, uh, I have one of that uh, assistants. Uh, like I told you, I will not say that their, their name because uh, she will wake up. Uh, but they have their functionality that you can say, okay, put me in touch with this person. And I think the, the, the system will call directly to that person in order to you to you know exchange some words about something about the news. So I think the, the, the technology and the companies are moving forward this uh, social thing uh, by using uh, digital means. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much. I have here one more question. So, um, for example, I, I use uh, sometimes Amazon for buying my things and from time to time we, we live in an island and you know, package sometimes don't arrive and we have some problems. Uh, and then they have their uh, 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 boot, um, uh, bot shots. They, I can tell them, okay, I have this problem with this um, package, can you solve the problem? Uh, and the, the, chat, the bot chat will solve the problem for me. Um, but in the case of the voice, do you think that sometime um, these personal assistants will replace the um, call centers, agents, uh, if they are able to understand our, us better using these artificial intelligence systems, if they can like understand how our mood and answer according to that mood. For example, if I am really pissed off with some uh, fun company or internet company, I will call them, oh, increase my, my, the velocity of my internet because I paid one thing and you give me another thing. So right. if they will understand this and will help us better? Yeah, first I think it will go to that direction and I think it will be chatbots and voice together. It won't be only one of them because sometimes when you maybe want to write down your number, or write down your email, it's much easier to just write it down than to just pronounce it. Maybe she will not get one of the digits or one of the characters. But for sure, it will be much easier to do it like when you call the, the support center and what they would do, it will take them some time, but it will get there. They will take all the data from the recordings. They will get their best say or support person and they will be the character of this very, very successful support person. And then they could just multiply it. This is what they'll do because it really makes sense. They could take the data, you know, what are the calls that are escalating and needs more attention? And then only these will go to a human voice. And the ones which are, I want to cancel my subscription, I want to ask questions, I want like things which are very like, could you check my network, whatever, which is like partially automated already, you could just talk to them and it will be a better experience for you as a human being. And, and it's for them, it, it's replacing these people answering the calls, which is very, very expensive. The support centers cost a lot. Yes, for them, it's good. 
Yeah, so Turing has one test that, uh, so you are writing to a computer and whether you not know that you're talking with a computer. Um, so they have this kind of tests trying to see if you can perceive that you are talking with a human or with the computer. Do you think that uh, in some times in the future we will able to uh, surpass the, the Turing tests? We, we can do it right now. I right think now. that, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that um, you saw that like two or three years ago, I don't remember exactly, when they uh, showed uh, in Google um, um, conference, IO conference, he, the, the assistant who called the barber shop and then he talked to him. Do you remember that one? Yeah. So, and it was totally like two-sided and you didn't understand that it was a device that you're talking to. And I think we're going to that direction. Of course, it worked only a specific use case in a specific domain. It's not that easy, but we are going to, and it's not that far. It's, it's not that far. They are gathering information as more and more people are using it more uh, people are talking to it, more people are purchasing with voice, and it's really getting there. It's almost there, I would say, and it's not that far. Yeah, thank you. So looking forward sure. to hearing more, okay? I sure. will and remove me from the stream. Okay. Yeah, so I'll continue. If you have any questions, I feel free, and if not, we'll meet in the end, and if you have any further questions, I'll be happy. Okay, so, thank you. see you. Okay, so let's continue. So now we're going to talk about using the power of emotions and how we do it within a product experience in general. So we know that when we are more emotional within an experience, we are doing more because it drives us to do something. So emotion is connected to motion, it's connected to deciding to do something because when we feel something, we do it. When we want, when we feel like we love chocolate, we we, we just go from the sofa and take the chocolate cake from the fridge. When we feel like uneasy, maybe sometimes we go in and browse our Facebook. Sometimes we'll just go and shop something online. So emotions make us do things. And this is something that advertising is doing so well. So using our emotions in order to create a difference in the way that we ask, in order to do what the uh, promotion is, try is trying to sell us. And, and we know that and when we try to see the impact that when customers feel it has bigger uh, influence on their loyalty than the effectiveness or ease of use. So something which, is, which makes us feel is more important than the functionality. And you see that in Apple, for example, this is a brand that is, is crafted so well. So the connection with their uh, buyers, with their clients is so deep and it's not connected to their uh, technical abilities it's connected to the emotional uh, connection with the brand and we see it very well in their sales the same thing could be influencing uh, the buying experience we know that uh, if we have a higher music in in the store it makes us buy more if we have very calm music it makes us buy less and that's why when you go to many stores the music is sometimes really loud and very um, like uh, um, energetic. We know that kids in the UK and the US are buying to these devices, kids very small, 6 to 16, they are already used to buying and shopping from these uh, devices and it's related to the fact that they trust them and they feel very well with them and, and they have this connection with them. Oh, this is the question we already done. And now we're going to talk about designing this connection. So till now, we talked about this uh, emotional connection with the system, the assistant revolution, I would say, and the, the fact that we have voice as an interface right now. So how do we design this experience of talking to someone? I guess that many of you think that you have a prompt and you have an answer, you know what the answer could be, and you collect data in order to uh, make it more and more um, feasible and more uh, friendly and, and you have more options to answer, which is great. And it's just a tree of, of this decision tree. But actually it's not that because we're in the stage which is so early with the technology. And it's, as I see it, uh, when I started many years ago, when we came to a project, it was the, 
yeah, it's working. We all only have this problem that users cannot use it. So before even like, only when Windows started. So people thought the functionality, the technology, the capabilities, the features are the most important. And, and sometimes people still feel that, but it has changed through the years. And we know that the fact that people are uh, really, it, it's easy for them to use and they are connected and they're engaged in the experience. You know that this is what makes them really buy and stay with a product. Of course, it needs to work, but this is like obvious. It's not the main reason to make a purchase or to stay with the company. So we need to design these connections, even in voice, especially because it's so young. And one of the factors we are designing is this persona. So when we are saying persona, sometimes we think about the end users, but in this case, we're talking about these, uh, these, these entities the Alexa, the Siri, the Cortana, the Google Home, all of them, they, are, they have a personality. Somebody sat and thought, that's her name, she's married, she's not, how old is she, what's her hobbies, does she have friends, that, what's her cousins are doing. So these entities have a, a, a total story and they have a persona and the way they're talking, the way they're reacting. So it's all like a human being that somebody sculptured. And when we are designing these uh, assistant uh, um, skills or uh, actions for Google, we need to design who is this speaker, who is going to talk to us. And we need to ask ourselves who he is, who these users are going to talk to. And the connection between them is very, very important. And sometimes it could be somebody maybe older than them, maybe someone that he's like, let's say we're, we're, we're doing a, a running application, which really makes sense because when we're running, we cannot see the screen because we're doing an action. We need to, our eyes on, on, the, on, on the road and we're running and somebody could guide us and maybe coach us while we're running. And, and, and the connection with this culture is very important. Maybe it's a cousin that we're just running for fun and, and gossiping on the way. Maybe it's a, a, world, a world athlete that, that is uh, training us. So the connection between these two entities will be totally different. The way I would talk to them, the way, the way they could talk to me will be different. And we're designing this connection in order to be an immersive and, and, and a joyful experience for me. And the most important question is, what do you want the users to feel? Because when I talk to this very world-class athlete, I look up to him and I really admire him. And I want to, to feel that he is like a, a giving me attention and, and telling me that I'm really great and, and, and I feel like in the top of the world. But when I, talk, when I run with my cousin, I just want to chat with her. I don't really care if she says that I'm running well or not, and I just I don't expect her to give me a tips on how should I hold my hands, right? So the connection is what do I feel when I talk to them, and 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 this is what we're trying to design. And how we design these uh, assistants is is how do do we design the, the the emotional connection is through the voice through the tone, the words we're using, the energy, the pace, the style, the emotional style of, of the way that we're talking. Okay, so we can design these characteristics of the voice of the conversation, you know, to make it a good voice experience. And without thinking about these factors, you could do something which is functional, but the experience will not be natural and human. So I just want to give you an example of a voice that you could, a very, very short uh, uh, section, and I want you to tell me if you uh, could recognize the voice, okay? So listen, like, put your volume a bit high and listen to that. I didn't do it. Nobody saw me do it. There's no way I can prove anything. So I hope you recognize this guy. I hope that one of you, like, raising your hand, because it's, it's Bart. And the way that he speaks, you know that from his voice that he's small, that he is a kid and he's short. And the way he's pitching, I didn't do it in a way so you can do everything because he's jumping all the time, he's very energetic. And you hear it only from two seconds of, your, of his voice. So we can do it like we're, so, we're doing it so naturally, so easy for us to just listen to this very small 
part of, of sound and we know exactly who is this person talking to us. And one of, the, of my uh, favorite uh, ads in the world is, uh, is um, Serena Williams in, in the Nike. Do, do you remember they, they say that we're crazy? Do you remember this? I, I, I advise you to go and see this is one of the best ads for, for Nike. And she was their representative for a very, very, very long time. And you could have the connection with the brand and the personality of with the brand is an emotional connection. And you can see that in this ad, she's just doing the voice. You don't hear her. That's in the end you see her, but she's talking and everybody knows this, that, that it's her, in America at least, because they know this personality and what it represents for them. And we can just imagine if we're taking Serena and her voice just to go with us to the Nike store and tell us what is the best shoes for our tennis lesson and what is the impact on the experience while she's doing that. And we can just take it a bit further and think what is these entities, what are these entities and what could be the connection? For example, we can take Kim Kardashian and her voice and her entity really will help on it, us, us doing, doing shopping in a fashion app or Let's say we're, we're watching a football uh, game. So maybe Lionel Messi will be next to us and he will talk to us about the game or maybe uh, uh, help us with the sports app. Or Jamie Oliver could cook with us or Gandalf could play fantasy game with us. So these entities that we know so well from the real lives out there could go into the experience and, and, and it will surely be the next step as if that, that they are taking to add, it could be connected to what we're doing. And it's really easy to capture their voice. We don't need more than, I think, 30 minutes of very good recording, you know, to capture their voice and the way they talk and just use it. So this is what we have right now. What could be the future? So again, I want you to imagine, just sit in front of me and just imagine a day, a very, very bad day in the office. I guess that most of you had a very bad day in the office and you, you made a mistake and everybody's angry at you and, and you're so upset and you think you might be fired because of that uh, mistake. And it was the awful, awful day ever. And you're going from the office really down and you're getting home. And in that home, again, I'm going to give you a small um, audio uh, sound for you. You have a friend waiting for you, just listening, and he knows you, and he knows that you had a very, very bad day. And you tell him everything about what happened, and then you're so afraid that you'll get fired, and what will happen, and your boss is like so enraged, and what, what, what could you do? And you come home, and then he tells you, listen to that. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Right. So I hope that most of you really recognize this guy, which is Yala. So you could decide who you talk to when you come back at home and who will be your friend. And you could have this friend really listening to you and relating to you. And he knows you. And you know that you're, he, you're in a bad mood right now because he usually talks to you. And you know that currently you're in, in this down state. And it, you'll talk to him like frictionlessly and naturally. And it will be like a human being, like a roommate that you could decide upon, but you don't need to do anything for her. You don't need to cling for her. And, and, and it's not like a friend that you need to, to take care of her cat when she's abroad or something. You don't need to do anything for that connection. He's just there for you and to make you happy and to tell you what you want to hear and to tell you exactly what makes you feel good. And he's, he's totally 100% only for you. And it, it will understand you and you will understand him or her and it will convey a character and you will be connected to her or, she, or him and he will react to your emotions. And more than that, he knows everything about you because you've been like roommates for years. So he knows your favorite uh, ice cream um, flavor. He knows um, what, is, uh, what do you usually buy online. He knows what's your favorite show on, on Netflix, everything. 
because he is really helping you to do whatever you want. So this experience is going much more further than just talking and asking trivia questions as we see. So in the future, it's the, the experience will be personalized and customized, as, as I said. It will react to our emotions, and the voice revolution will change the way we, we experience the world uh, that we live in and our connections with technology. Uh, it will learn and remember uh, to be more, to, to us and to be more human. So just imagine when you're going to a doctor and you have this like 10, 15 minutes and like half of the time, even more, you're just typing and trying to find your file on, the, on his desk, desktop. So just imagine that he knows everything about your history, about what's going on with the pandemic in your situation, in your state, in your uh, specific city. He could do um, research from any research out there from medical um, um, ads or med medical uh, journals, whatever. He knows everything and he's there for you and he doesn't have a line. So he has more than 10 minutes just to listen to you. So it's always like going further and you're thinking and learning more about you and it could be there only for you. And it will convey personality and brand. Currently, these uh, Alexas and Siri's and, and Google Home and Cortana, they don't have that much personality, but they will have much more. So this is the future that we're going to grow into, which is which has good aspects and bad aspects. But this is what we're going into, for sure, especially right now after the COVID crisis. So now I'm open to any additional questions, if you want. I'm just saying that if you want to know more about Invincible Innovation, you can go invincibleinnovation.com. I'll be happy if you ask me any questions. And you can, you can find me on LinkedIn, actually. So Adima Zolkalio on LinkedIn. And if you have any question or feedback, I'm really, really happy to answer. Hey, thank you, Adi, once again. Uh, yeah, I have here one question about um, the voice emotion, and I also have here a general question. So why, for example, uh, you see Alexa, you see Siri, you see Cortana, or there are all female names? This was chosen because of the emotional part of the user. This has some relation with that. That's a good question. I'm so happy that you asked it. It's not by chance. And, and sometimes they will say that most humans prefer a, a female voice, which is, this is true. Most, most humans will prefer a female voice. Maybe it's connected to the fact they heard their mother when, once they were in the womb or because it's, it's a calmer voice. But I think if you ask me, it's more than that, because these are your digital servants. And who will be your assistant and servant? Who would you prefer? Most people will say that they prefer a servant, which is a female. And that's why they decided that. Yeah. Uh, well, I think you convinced me to do some application with my personal uh, virtual assistant. Okay, now let me just ask you uh, a general question. So can you tell us about what you are doing now in terms of voice emotion? What are your future projects? Can you talk us sure. about that, please? So first I'm doing voice, uh, voice design sprints and I'm doing design sprints. But currently I'm going into the direction of, of innovation and helping bigger companies. So till now I work with lots of companies, bigger, companies in Israel, in Israel, corporates and startups. And what I learned from startups and from the uh, innovation world in, in general, I could help with in corporates, with bigger companies that they're really, really struggling to do something new. For them to do something as a startup, it's, it's very like hard for them. Because, you know, like big corporates, they have bureaucracy and the culture is very hierarchical and so many people involved and it's hard for them to move. And sometimes they don't have any motivation to do so. You know, like they, they are making lots of money. Why should they change? And, and this question is raised all the time. And the answer is because if you don't change, you just die. If you don't grow, bring more value, create further and better products and new products and new services, you will not be here. In the past, companies would live like 60 years. 
And currently it's about 17, 18 years. And I think that after COVID, it will might be even like 12, 15 years after the, un, un, until a company is like dead, broke. So if they don't grow, they will just die. And they need to know what startups and, and entrepreneurs know really well, which is growing within uncertainties and doing things once you don't know exactly how. And this is what I learned from working with startups, and, and this is what I want to help them to do with. So, so in the last like six, maybe seven months, I've been working with the companies, helping them to, to work within these uncertainties and to create products. I uh, created this uh, online accelerator called Invincible Innovation, and I wrote a book about that, which is called Innovating Through Chaos, about building uh, unbeatable products in uncertain times which is exactly what we need right now. Yeah, I, I agree. So lastly, I just want you to invite to come to Madeira to see our I news uh, and to have a dinner with us uh, and you, you know to know also the most famous places here in uh, Europe. Okay. So let's, let's make a wish all us together that maybe next year in Death Fest, I'll be in Madeira. And oh, then yeah, we'll that's a <laughs> so and let's hope the the, the COVID virus by that by it's that here, time is over. <laughs> yeah, I truly truly hope, and I want to uh, um I really want to thank everyone that joined us and and took this time to listen, and they really feel free to ask me questions. I'm on LinkedIn or in Digital Innovation, and I'll be very happy to answer. Once again, on, be on behalf of the GDG Tech Sessions, I want to thank you uh, for your effort, for the work that you've been putting in these years about those emotions. Okay, thank you very much. We really thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, uh, so let's just finish this talk. As I told you, this is the first talk of two talks. Um, but first, since we want to hear, we want to hear your. Uh, opinion, what do you think about our uh, Dev Fest? So please feel free uh, to answer this feedback form in order to help us to improve uh, on uh, future uh, events. Okay, so the next talk will be about, well, machine learning, which is related with artificial intelligence and somewhat with personal assistance. So stay tuned. That project uh, that uh, will then be on the next um, event. So you please check the, the description of this video in order to jump directly to uh, to the next stream. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll see you soon.